I've got my knife and fork. Uh -huh. Is this what I do? Just slice you need them? You sneak them by your hands. If you want, hands. just your fingers, yeah. They're okay. like a finger thing. You just break them. Oh. And they're crispy on the outside. Yeah, so crispy. And they're crispy. fluffy on the inside. Yes. Mm. I'm in a street food hall in Salford in the northwest of England, trying food from Jamaica. When they and smell... <gasps> Eat them Divine. just by themselves, or you can have some gravy with them, or some sauce, whatever you fancy. Or you can just eat them plain by themselves. And although this is specifically Jamaican, you can find this sort of thing in almost all cuisines. Welcome to The Food Chain from the BBC World Service with me, Ruth Alexander. And this week, we're finding out all about one of the world's favourite comfort foods. Take a juice bomb in your mouth. I will never forget this taste. It was heaven. <laughs> it fills the tummy and it takes you almost a whole day before you feel hunger again. Dumplings. We're going to chart their history. We also have fossilised dumplings. Fossilised oh, dumplings. That, that's about 1,700 years old. And examine what it is exactly that makes us love them so much. I don't think I'll be able to eat enough dumplings <laughs> before I die. Remember, you move it around and move it around, yeah? And that's how you do it, and then you do that with it, yeah? To get your shape. This is Lola Nelson. And there you are. The better if your hands are warm. If your hands are warm, it's better for you. Lola, who hails originally from Jamaica, is one of the cooks at the Jerk Junction restaurant in Salford, showing me how to make the perfect Caribbean-style fried dumplings, solid balls of dough made from flour, baking powder, butter and water... Her colleague, Key Somna, is from Bermuda. Well, after we shape them into the bowls that we desire, you just drop them in the fryer slowly. How do you know when they're ready? You have a probe, but also from cooking them from long enough, you know when they're ready. Just know. What will they be eaten with? So a lot of people that order cory goat use the dumplings to soak up the sauce and eat the sauce. Or if they have a jerk chicken, they use the dumpling to soak up the jerk gravy. Growing up, were you eating these kind of dumplings at home? Yeah. yeah. We have these and we have something called festivals. The longer and the sweeter. But these in Bermuda, they're like triple the size. So the dumplings are like the size of a softball. They're so nice. A plate of glistening golden balls smelling a lot like donuts was pressed into my hands. So look, yes, look, I have some dumplings. Yes, you would have. Hmm. That's right. Comfort in a ball. Yes. It is. Very satisfying. Good. I'm trying to think what it tastes like. Just there's a biscuity taste. It's quite really? sweet. Okay. Because we put sugar in it, but you can do it without the sugar. Mm. Originally, Jamaican do fry dumpling and is known as journey cake because in the days when they were going on a journey there wasn't anything they could take and they'd make dumplings and take it with them and that's where the name original came from and being called journey cake. They travel well. Yes, they travel well, yeah. That's the reason why. And how often would your mum make these? It used to be on a Sunday morning. Mm. You used to have them on a weekend and you used to have them with this thing called ackee and sawfish. That's a Jamaican dish. What, what is that? It's a fruit from off the tree and salt fish is cod fish. Mm -hmm. And you cook it up with the ackee, you put onions, Scotch bonnet pepper, a bit of thyme, and a bit of seasoning, and you mix the two of them, and you have your fried dumpling and your yucking saltfish for breakfast on a Sunday morning. Lovely. Yes. When you eat them now, does it take you back to those days, those it Sundays? Always does. <laughs> it always does. Lola Nelson. Fried, boiled, whole, or filled with any number of ingredients, savoury or sweet, it's hard to think of a major food culture that doesn't feature dumplings in some form. So where did it all start? To find out, we got in touch with Professor Miranda Brown, a cultural historian of China, based at Michigan University in the United States, and currently in Taipei, Taiwan. I'm here this year on a Fulbright Fellowship, working on a book called Dumpling Therapy. I love the name. Why... Therapy. One of the early terms for dumpling like things that are encased meat and maybe some vegetables, you know, was borrowed from a different language. And this started sort of a personal crisis for me, which is how could dumplings be from anywhere other than the Chinese world? Because the implication is if you borrow a foreign word, 
to describe a food, it's probably a sign that the food may not be purely from your neck of the woods. So this news that dumplings may not be from China, that shook your world? Yes, yes. I mean, I you know, I grew up in a Chinese household and I had a Chinese parent who liked to emphasize that most great foods came from China. <laughs> it's a natural thing to hold on to. Dumplings in China are, I think, spectacular. I'm not going to say that they're the best in the world because that won't please everybody. But I think that you'd be hard pressed to find a group of people who do dumplings so well. OK, so let's define our mm-hmm. terms. What is a dumpling? Depending on where you are in the world, dumpling could mean something like a dough ball that people in Northern Europe consume that's maybe made with wheat or some other kind of starchy flour. But, you know, when we think about Chinese dumplings or dumplings like gyoza in Japan or Turkish manti, you know, we're thinking about typically a wheat wrapper that encases meat and vegetables And it can either be boiled or steamed or even pan fried, sometimes deep fried. But the idea is that we're dealing with encased dough pockets. Do we know who created the first dumpling? No, we don't. The earliest sort of descriptions of something that looks like a modern dumpling is from China, probably the early third century AD, though there have been sort of some More recent theories that I've seen that might suggest that something similar to the dumpling that was deep fried and maybe filled with sweet things might have come before that time, you know, to China along the Silk Road from what we think of as, you know, Central Asia. But I think the more solid identification, the first description is probably third century China, where you have sort of an odd term that it's manto. Many people think that that term was probably borrowed from a Turkic language or some other sort of foreign language. No one's really 100% sure. What is said about the dumpling in the earliest written records? Well, I mean, a number of things are said about them. We know that they have mutton and pork and sort of aromatics. They're consumed in the northern Chinese court and described as a delicacy, something, you know, along with other wheat products that is enjoyed by the ruling elite. We also have fossilized dumplings that had been recovered from northwest China along the Silk Road area. Um, Fossilized dumplings? That's about 1,700 years old. You know, often these archaeological finds come with a range of dates. What was inside them? We don't know what, but we know it's from northwest China, um, in an area that is at the crossroads of different civilizations, like most of northern China was in the medieval period. And that there have been some studies that suggest that that dumpling-looking thing might have been actually baked rather than boiled or steamed, which is a more Western Eurasian sort of method of preparing dough. It's amazing that a bowl of steamed dumplings can connect you with ancient dynasties many hundreds of years before someone perhaps sat somewhere in a similar place and ate something quite similar. Well, but they change, right? I mean, that's the most interesting thing is that in China, often the manto becomes yeasted and soft, um, more like bread. And then the fillings change, depending on where you are in the world. Professor Brown. While historians have been poring over the scraps of ancient evidence, dumpling lovers have been filling in the gaps with their own stories about where dumplings have come from. Our reporter in Hong Kong, Grace Choi, can tell us the word on the ground from her local eatery, Matt's Noodles. It's a bit cold today, so a wonton noodle is just what I need now. Dumplings are integral to Chinese culinary culture, and legend has it that it was invented by Zhang Zhongjing, a famous physician who lived more than 1,800 years ago. In the dead of winter, he was on his way to his home village but saw many poor and hungry people. He created a recipe by wrapping mutton and herbs in dough. I always find the English word dumplings a bit weird, I can think of at least 10 different kinds of Chinese dumplings and we have specific names for each of them. My favourite is wonton. I grew up eating the Hong Kong-style wonton, which is made of ground pork and shrimp. It is eaten with noodles in broth. My grandmother used to sell raw wontons as a hawker to make some extra cash for the family. My grandparents, along with my mom and her siblings, settled in Hong Kong from mainland China in the 1980s. It was very tough for them to make it here. Whenever I visited my grandmother on the weekend, she would be selling wontons at a shopping area of a very old building near her home. 
it was just her sitting on a stool and trying to sell wontons. My grandma did not teach me how to make wontons, but my sister and I tried to play around when she was making it. I'm too clumsy to learn how to make it, so I still don't know how now. I'm going to find out more about this iconic food in Hong Kong. Sitting beside me is Jeremy Lee, uh, one of the co-owners. I would like to know the secret of a good wonton. Could you tell us how wontons are made? The fillings with uh, fresh prawns. We also have our own seasoning and also uh, grounded flat fish. So these are the key ingredients of uh, our wonton fillings. The wrapping should be really thin. When you choose your ingredients, it has to be fresh and top grade. These are the basics that we think it's really important. All of our noodles and our wrappings is actually made by ourselves in our own kitchen. For other kinds of dumplings like jiaozi, the skins, it's a lot thicker. Yeah, so I think this is also one of the key differences between the northern part of China's dumpling and you know Hong Kong wonton. It's actually more white. Uh, most of the wonton uh, joints in Hong Kong, they use uh, shrimp in it, but they usually mix with uh, pork. Wonton is my comfort food, and I always get wonton noodles as my first meal after a long time away from home. I found someone who feels exactly the same about wonton at Max Noodles. I have been having uh, wonton noodles since I was a kid in Hong Kong. It's been more than 60 years. I migrated to U.S. 30 years ago, and I miss wonton noodles because the wonton noodles there is in no comparison to those in Hong Kong. It's all about the taste, the quality of the noodles, the soup, so it makes a big difference. But the price is much higher in in the U.S. (laughs) Wonton is a quintessential food in Hong Kong. But can we keep the tradition alive? Probably 10 years back, our customers are usually more the older generation because this delicacy seems to belong to their generation. I feel like there's a comeback for wonton noodles. These few years, there are actually a lot more younger people coming to our shops and enjoy wonton noodles, and they like it, and they return. Jeremy Lee, talking to the BBC's Grace Choi in Hong Kong. We know the Chinese were some of the earliest eaters of dumplings, but how did they spread to other parts of the world? Miranda Brown picks up the story. It spreads in part because wherever it was created, it was happening in a place that we could think of as a contact zone or at the crossroads of different civilizations. When you have trade routes, you know, things move, diseases, foods. And I think that was one way that the dumpling probably spread out from this amorphous space somewhere in northern or northwestern China, I would guess. How did it come to be called a dumpling? So this is a question, right? It was one of a number of translations for this food. I mean, I've seen early turn of the century menus that give us a sense of, you know, the translation of Chinese food into the United States. And there they're called Chinese ravioli. Mm. And so that's points to people sort of using a known food to describe it, less familiar food. I think, you know, the reason why we think of the classic Chinese dumpling as a dumpling in English is because when the dumpling arrived in the United States, it was compared to other soupy foods that are made with flour, or the German soup dumpling. Professor Brown. One way or another, the dumpling journeyed through Central Asia, the Middle East and across Africa, where in parts today is a favourite way of adding carbohydrates to a dish and soaking up sauce and juices. Kafui Adja, who owns an in-flight food business, Okasombo Catering, has been telling me about Ghana's most popular dumplings, kenke. I love kinky. In fact, I had kinky this afternoon. You've had some this afternoon? Yes. Oh, lovely. And it hits the spot? Absolutely. And it's a gawe. The gawe is one of the tribes in Ghana. And kinky is their staple food, even though it's eaten across the whole country. How are kinky made? Okay, so kinky is made from corn. So you have to ferment the corn by soaking the corn in water for a couple of days. Then you get to send the corn to the meal. You meal it, you bring it back home, and then you add water to it to achieve a certain consistency. 
Now you ferment that for a day and then you can make something like a paste sort of. So when you cook that dough on fire for some time, let's say 10, 15 minutes, you take it down and then mix it with the fresh dough that you already have set aside. So you mix that to achieve a certain texture and consistency. Then you mold that into balls. Now, the thing about kenke is that it's only cooked in husk, corn husk, and now cook on fire. The water shouldn't be too much on the kenke, otherwise it will make it into a porridge. So that steam is what cooks the kenke, and it cooks it over a period of time, say about 40 minutes, 40 to one hour, your kenke is ready. Gosh, after days of effort. Yes, you don't just get up and go to the kitchen to make kenke like how we can cook rice. No, kenke is a process. Would you say there's quite an art to it? <laughs> it is, but we love it. <laughs> how is it then eaten? Now, we have to eat kenke with what we call shito, chili sauce, okay? But we also have the black sauce. It's like with shrimps, fish, and all sort of proteins in it. And then yum, yum, you, you go at it. You dig in. So is this really satisfying comfort food? It is very satisfying. In fact, kenke is loved by most people who do manual works because it fills the tummy and it takes you almost a whole day before you, you feel hungering again. And how about up in the air? Do you have kenke on the menu? You know, I mentioned earlier that you dig in with your hand, but where we have to serve kenke in the air, we have to slice it. We've tried it on a private jet serving passengers and it worked perfectly well. OK, so it's street food, but even people travelling by private jet enjoy kenke. Yes, you can enjoy it. Who taught you how to make kenke? I learnt it. <laughs> I learnt it from an old woman who makes kenke. I've seen my mom make kenke at home, but at the time I didn't learn that from her. How do you think your kenke compares to your mum's? I think my own is better. <laughs> Kafui Adja in Ghana. There's a huge difference between these hefty corn balls and the dainty parcels of meat and fish Grace talked about in Hong Kong. And in Poland, the two styles kind of come together in a dumpling that our next guest regards as the country's national dish. This is Anita Stanisławska, a city tour guide ordering a plate of pierogi in a cafe in Krakow. And I understand that your tours include dumplings. Of course. <laughs> we do also the cooking classes with uh, dumplings. So we know everything about dumplings. And of course, we know everything about dumplings because we are Polish. Oh, right. So to be Polish is to know about dumplings. So why? Why are dumplings so loved by the Poles? Well, we are very um, practical people. And it is also from the history. Dumplings for us is quick, easy, available food. You can buy dumplings everywhere right now. And you may bring them home and just boil. And that's it. It's easy to prepare. And it is delicious, healthy food. Tell me about the most quintessential Polish dumpling. Pierogis. The most popular pierogis are with cheese and potato, and with fried onion, salt and pepper. We called them before Russians, but right now, you know, because of the political reasons, we don't want to. And we say just with cheese and potatoes. The second version is sauerkraut and mushrooms. And the third very, very traditional way of uh, preparing pierogi are with meat, of course. What do they look like and how are they prepared? It looks like a small pocket. It depends where are made. The pockets are smaller or bigger. The secret of the best pierogies is dough. And another secret, the dough has to be rolled out thinly but not too thin. This is very, very important. And when you put to this salted water, if the dough is not too thin or too thin, the pierogies can 
prepared during the cooking. And what do you remember about the pierogies your your mum was making when you were a child? Do you have fond memories? I have, I have. Every summer, when I was a little girl, we stayed in a small village in the mountains. There was a lady there. She made such a wonderful pierogies with the blueberries and the sweet cream. So I will never forget this taste. Believe me, it was it was heaven. <laughs> Do you know the history of, of how pierogies came to be eaten in Poland? Of course, this is like a Bible for us. I remember from history that 12th century Mongols attacked Europe. They invaded Europe. And they went farther and farther to the west. They stopped in Kiev in 1240. And one year later, 1241, they were already in Poland. And according to history documents, they brought dumplings to Poland through this invasion in 13th century. Mongols devastated Poland, I have to say. That was terrible, terrible invasion. They murdered a lot of people. But what they did, they left us pierogi. This is the story how they came to Poland. However, we don't want to remember this. So we have also a legend, a story about Saint Jack. He stayed actually in a monastery. He was a monk in a monastery in Kiev. And this is where he first time tried pierogi and he brought this idea and the recipe from Kiev to Poland. So this is what we say about pierogi. Saint Jack, we treat him as a patron of the pierogi. At the moment, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you've dropped the Russian from the name of the pierogi. I wonder, is there politics in pierogi? Me and many like me, we right now like to support Ukrainians, of course, and we don't want to say any more that Russian pierogies. When you eat pierogi, are you thinking about when you were growing up and your mum was making them? I am thinking about my mum. Yes, I am thinking about my mom, about my, my father, how we quarreled, who will eat more pierogies. My father and my brother, they, they could eat more than we. And, you know, the, the discussions, I remember that I'm telling these stories to my daughter. And this is something what is very, very important, the memories. So you're passing family memories and recipes down the generations when you're making pierogi. Oh, sure, of course, I have a secret a notebook. You know what I said to my mom? Remember this notebook with all your recipes is mine. <laughs> because my brother wants to. <laughs> You've laid claim to it. Of course. <laughs> this is mine. Anita Stanisławska in Poland. There's a lot to fight about when it comes to dumplings. Cultural historian Miranda Brown says discussions about their origins can get quite heated. A lot of people want to own the dumpling, right? I think there's this idea that everybody wants to be the first to come up with a dumpling. Mm -hmm. If you borrowed it, you must be derivative, right? And then therefore your cuisine must be less great, right? But I, you know, I think that when it comes to matters of dough, it, there's no such thing as derivative, right? Or it's maybe it's good to be derivative. Does it matter who made the first dumpling? And does it matter if we never know? I think we have to reframe the question, right? This is not an IP question of who gets the patent or who deserves a Nobel Prize for coming up with the dumpling. <laughs> I think the truth about the dumpling is that it appears at the crossroad of civilizations. If I were to guess, and I'm sure someone will be unhappy, it's probably Chinese cooks interacting with people who work with wheat products who came through the Silk Road. So, you know, either Iranians or Turks or other groups from Central Asia, uh, some people think Northern Indians potentially, the melding of different food ways that helped create and popularize this food. And so I'm not sure it would have been possible, you know, if you had any sort of culture in isolation. We're kind of moving into an era where there's a lot of calls for isolation. Uh, but for me, the dumpling is a reminder that we're actually better when we're open and we're cooking with others. and sharing foods and also experimenting with each other's foods. And so that for me, I think is the, the takeaway, which is to, you know, to worry less about who owns something rather than thinking about how people were and continue to be connected. Do you think we're at peak dumpling or do you think we might yet see more 
coming into the world, more different types. I hope we see more. The thing we know about dumplings is that the fillings have changed for at least 2,000 years. And so there's just no end of possibility and innovation. I'm here in Taiwan. I've seen lots of corn inside of dumplings. I've seen kimchi inside of dumplings, which is a Korean touch. You can find cheese inside of dumplings. There are places in America where they put Philly cheesesteak in dumplings. I don't know about that, but... (laughs) So, I mean, it's an incredibly versatile medium. What's your favorite? I've tried that. What's my favorite? Right now, it's the uh, Shalombo. It's the soup dumpling from Shanghai. The particular kind that I like is the one made with crab roe. That is my absolute favorite. I'm not sure if my doctor would want me to eat that every day. (laughs) It's like a juice bomb in your mouth. And this is amazing. But I also really enjoy dumplings from other parts of the world. You know, I don't think I'll be able to eat enough dumplings <laughs> before I die. Professor Miranda Brown. Meanwhile, back in the Krakow Cafe, Anita's order has arrived. This is something new. I have one with the raspberries, meat, sweet cheese. And I'm going to try it because I never tried. This is the first time. It's perfect. My style. I like sweet. Our thanks to Anita Stanisławska and everyone we spoke to for today's programme. And what's your favourite dumpling? Do please email the food chain at bbc.co.uk and make our mouths water. From me and the rest of the team, Julia Paul and Rumela Dasgupta, thanks for listening. And join us again next week. <laughs>